Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to practice together, and also for your for your uh, interest in this very important topic. It's a topic that I used to talk about uh, at least twice a year. I think when we first moved up from Los Angeles to Oregon, and after about seven years, the saga said. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> we're, we've, been, we've been very well educated on this subject, and let's just move on with practice. But unfortunately, these uh, forms of suffering don't go away. And uh, one of the reasons for giving this talk tonight is, in the past year, the American Zen teachers, and there are two organizations that Hogan and I belong to, the American Zen Teachers Association, which is Zen teachers in different traditions, in Rinzai Japanese Zen tradition, in Soto Zen tradition, and in the Korean Zen tradition. And sometimes we have people from the Thich Nhat Hanh Vietnamese Zen tradition come to that meeting, too. So it, it crosses uh, lineages and traditions, American Zen Teachers Association. And then the other uh, organization is the Soto Zen Teachers Association, S-Z-B-A, Soto Zen Buddhist Association. And that is just Soto Zen teachers. And they have, both groups have met at the monastery uh, various times. And in this past year, the AZTA, American Zen Teachers Association, and the SZBA have been dealing with two situations in which uh, Zen teachers in America were involved in misconduct. The first situation involved Edo Shimano Roshi, who's a Japanese teacher who's been in the United States for decades, maybe 40 years or more. And we've known about uh, his predation on women students and uh, verbal abuse of women students, emotional abuse of women students for many years. And we tried, about well, 15 years ago, the ACTA, which was a fledgling organization, uh, wrote a letter to the board of the Zen Studies Society, his organization in New York, uh, asking that an end be put to this kind of behavior because the teachers were seeing fallout, all of us were seeing fallout of this misconduct. So we were getting refugees and victims and survivors from his organization. And we were assured at the time that his behavior stopped. But then last summer, two American teachers who have been transmitted by him and are teaching, one in Seattle and one in Syracuse, came to the AZTA meeting uh, and told us that a new episode had just occurred. So uh, this blew everything open again. And uh, the Americans and Teachers Association uh, has learned a lot in the last 15 years about teacher misconduct, unfortunately. So uh, we all work together to support these other two teachers in dealing with this situation, this time in a very effective way. So uh, Ada Shimano has resigned and is no longer teaching under the auspices of the Zen Studies Society or at Dago's Office of Zen Monastery in the Catskills in New York. There's still a lot of issues to resolve. Things have not um, completely settled down, but uh, effective action has been taken by the group of Americans and teachers who collectively wrote a letter and then individually also wrote letters about the situation, which helped bring it uh, into the public eye. Some people were aware of it because Aiken Roshi, who uh, died last year, had known for about 40 years. He had been a person to whom people who had been abused by Edo Roshi went for counsel for 40 years. And he had tried for 40 years to stop this behavior and had been unsuccessful and uh, felt very badly about this himself, that he had not been able to prevent more victims from uh, being damaged by uh, Shimano's behavior. So uh, he, had, he had collected papers 
And these were published on the web starting about two years ago, I think. Um, Kate Marshall gave permission to the University of Hawaii, who, who, were the, who was the repository of his uh, collected papers, to uh, publish publicly what was called the Aiken Shimano Archive. So people had become aware of his past behavior, and then when the new episode arose, then that sparked the teachers to say something must be done. So we had just about uh, recovered from that episode, which was quite quite difficult to, to bring to, a, to any kind of resolution where we felt comfortable about what had happened. When, uh, in February, my uh, Dharma brother, the person that I trained with at ZCLA, again, by Giselle, was uh, discovered to be involved with at least three women students over the past few years. Um, both of these teachers were married. Uh, the Edo Shimano Roshi has been married all this time, and Tempo's uh, been married too. Uh, and in the case of Genpo, this was the third episode in his career as a ordained Zen person and teacher. The first was at ZCLA in 1983. Uh, revelations came out that he had been involved with a number of women students that had affairs with them, um, at least five. And at the same time, uh, as, as secrets were being uh, revealed, being brought to light, also, Mazumi Roshi's alcoholism came to light, and we, the whole sangha at ZCLA, about 100 people, attended an intervention, professional intervention. Uh, so we were the alcoholic family that we uh, educated about the dynamics of alcoholism. It was quite, quite stunning. And also, Mazumi Roshi's affairs uh, came out at that time, too. We had affairs with students. So with Genpo, the first episode was at ZCLA in 1983. Then he moved to Maine and founded the Kanzion Zen Center in Maine. But then um, there were revelations in 1991, I believe, that he had been involved with at least one student, and I know of more, uh, in Maine. So that center was uh, sent into turmoil, and uh, the assets were sold. And then he moved to Oregon, uh, in Oregon, I worked with him, and the Carlson's worked with him on, on these issues to no success. And so we had an intervention involving others and teachers, um, a hearing in which some of the uh, victims came and testified. And uh, with the result, the Gentle moved to Salt Lake City, and then married, and it looked like things had really settled down. And, uh, he became a, a leader in the White Plum lineage, which is our lineage, and helped actually deal with mis issues of misconduct with two other teachers in our lineage that, had, that arose, and helped deal with them very effectively, and talked uh, very strongly uh, and very convincingly about keeping the precepts and the importance of the precepts and how he had ignored the precepts in his previous um, life as a teacher. So then we thought things were uh, going along well, and then in February, the new, new episode. So the Americans and teachers, and the soldiers and teachers, now had a new episode to deal with. And uh, as some of you may know, if you've, if you've looked at the site sweeping in, we wrote a letter, signed by 44 teachers, asking various things of the Kanzion Simpson board. Kanzion now moved from Maine to South and we asked that they not sell the asset, not sell the center this time, because that leaves people not only bereft of a spiritual teacher, but bereft of a center in which they can process and heal and renew their practice and go on. So we ask that that not be done this time. And we ask that Gempo um, take at least a year leave of absence to indicate how seriously he took this uh, misbehavior and the harm that he had done, and that he received professional counseling, specific to clergy abuse. Well, none of that has happened. The center's been put up for sale last, about two weeks ago, 
Um, and uh, you can read on you can read on the website, so you can ask me questions later. I realize that this talk will lead to a lot of questions, so if you can save your questions, remember your questions, I can answer them at the end. So that's a situation which is still evolving and not evolving well, I would say. Um, the, the center is in disarray. Uh, some people have elected to stay with Gempo as a teacher of big mind, and um, others have, have left and are trying to find places of practice. So why is this an issue? Uh, this is an issue for me, personally, because both Genpo and Moizumi Roshi initiated affairs with me while I was a student at UCLA. So I have personal knowledge of the dynamics and the damage that can be done when a teacher crosses boundaries and gets involved sexually with students. Uh, both Hogan and I, because Hogan was at ZCLA at the time, personally witnessed the destruction and the turmoil that clergy misconduct can cause, and any any kind of misuse of power. This this falls under the larger category of misuse of power. So it can be sexual misuse, <coughs> financial misuse of power. It can be misuse of the of the pulpit of the of the speaking, uh, the ability to speak to a group like I'm speaking to you now. So it can take many forms, and often there's not just one aspect involved. So after Hogan and I moved from ZCLA and came up to Oregon, we, in particular, I read a lot about uh, spiritual communities that had gone awry to try to see, what, what, how does this happen? So I read about the Hare Krishnas, I read about the Rajneeshis, which was a very hot issue here in Oregon when we moved here. In, 1984, um, and did, did a lot of study about spiritual groups and so the, the signals that things are, are going off the rails. And then Hogan and I went to train at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. It was a training offered by what's now called the Faith Trust Institute in Seattle, headed by Marie Fortune, who's a Protestant minister who, and the Faith Trust Institute and Marie Fortune have a particular interest in issues of domestic violence, child abuse, and virgin misconduct, and have done a lot of writing um, and professional, very professional trainings on this issue. And they offer this training around the country. So Hogan and I went to one of the trainings. We were the only Buddhists who had ever done it and still have ever done it, although we've encouraged our colleagues to attend the training. So it was designed for Christian ministers and Jewish congregations, Jewish rabbis, and Catholic priests and congregations. But we discovered that if you just change the language a little bit, the dynamics are the same. So we um, did a period of training on issues of Christian misconduct, and I have a lot of materials that uh, came out of that training and subsequent trainings downstairs for you to see. And then we uh, have given that training, given variations of that training in workshops to uh, Buddhist teachers around the country and also at centers like Spirit Route, centers that were having some difficulties. We also held a retreat for survivors of abuse by Hindu and Buddhist teachers. Um, and that was maybe 10 years ago. So a group of women came to that uh, retreat. And Marie Fortune came down and and trained us in leading that kind of retreat. Uh, we've adv advised various sanghas when issues of Persian misconduct have come up. And uh, I've written a lot on this. I've, I, I brought some of the things that I've written down downstairs <coughs> so you can look at them. There's a publication from the Buddhist Peace Fellowship called Safe Harbor. Because ZCLA wasn't the only Zen center that had problems with Persian misconduct 